Hello and good evening. I hope you can hear me. I hope I'm audible and um, able to be heard. Good evening to Bernadette and Rue and Nicole and Tina De Silva and Kitty Cat, Harriet Blanca and Susie Ashenton, Nicola Campbell, Bristland, Tina Griffiths, Chris and Laney. Lydia of Aragon, Nikki Darville, Sharon Oz Venom. That's an interesting name if ever there were one. Venom. Right. Tea and Toast and Tarot. Susan Gent, Paulie. Okay. Well, thank you, Anna Perkins, Eliza, Chili, Karin, and Rexan, Heidi Crimmins, and Joe McIntyre. Hello to you all. Anyway, here we are on a Thursday evening. Now, many people have been talking on the Twitter about the program that comes on the BBC tonight. Now, many of you I know don't like the BBC, but there will be question time tonight, which will feature a dreadful woman called Isabel Oakshot. Now, I don't know how much you know about Isabel Oakshot, but I've had my run-ins with her in the past. Um, I once went to a party with her, with her um, well, she attended the same party I attended um, in, um, in, in St. James's for the launch of Stuart Wheeler's book. She turned up wearing her gym gear. I've never seen anyone so badly dressed. And she dates that moron, Richard Tice, who I used to see in Waitrose buying yellow sticky items. Nothing wrong with buying a yellow sticky item, but this is a man who wanted Brexit and thus brought upon us his desires for chlorinated chicken, if ever there were anything worse to put on the British people than chlorinated chicken that could flood this country, which will be something that we don't need to be eating, even if there is a cost of living crisis. So, yes, um, Mrs. Um, Oakshot is trending on Twitter because she has been banging on about her latest rants about Remainers, her latest rants about immigration, and she will now be given a platform on BBC Question Time. Now, what reason is there to put this woman who makes things up in books about pigs and all sorts of nonsense with David Cameron? You might not like David Cameron, but the pig thing is a complete load of rubbish. And this silly woman is going to be on the Question Time programme tonight. I don't think that's appropriate. I don't think she is a useful guest, an intelligent guest. You know, she wanders the streets in her gym wear. She goes to parties in her gym gear. She is a very strange woman. And as for that man of hers, Richard Tice, there's nothing enticing about him. He is a complete bag of bilge. And I've had, um, you know, a series of nonsense from him over the years also. Um Mr. Tice does not like me, but I don't like him. So, um, you know, he uh, he's claimed that I was jealous of Eliz of Isabel's success once. Um, and you're a two-bit journo of a two-bit rag that no one has ever heard of. Keep going, Matthew, he said to me once on Twitter. Um, you know, I responded about his... Uh, Stickered shopping um, episodes, celebrity waitrose, Bell Braver, as it was known. So there we go. I think the man has had two sh shandies too many, to be honest. That's how I feel about him. Mr. Tice is totally unenticing. So anyway, she will be appearing on that program this evening. So I will not be watching, but um, I'm sure some of you will. So there we go. Um, but yellow stickers are great things. Yes, we uh, um, are learning that Angela puts yellow, uh, Paulie puts yellow stickers on other things. Oh, well, there we go. I suppose you could 
if you can get hold of the yellow sticker machine, which I have been known to in a Sainsbury's in the past, um, uh, I will admit it. There was a young man who worked there who I nicknamed Idi Amin, and he was very generous with a yellow sticker. He'd stick a yellow sticker on anything you asked him to do, but I don't think he works there anymore. But cheers to Idi Amin of Sainsbury's Belgravia. His real name was Edie, but he wasn't called Edie, I mean. Anyway. Yes, Bernadette points out that Isabel assisted Matt Hancock with his book and then stabbed him in the back. And she claims, I'm no fan of Matt Hancock. Well, still, as a journalist, she should have ethics. She clearly doesn't. This is a woman with no moral compass. That is why she's involved in ranting at people like Michael Heseltine, a decent gentleman, whose daughter I had a little um, dialogue with as she struggled with her travels across Europe in a similar way to I struggled across my travels with Europe um, recently also. But um, I believe she must be back in England by now and she's ready for her next adventure. Um, Michael Hazeltine's daughter does do a lot of traveling and uh, she does so in a very stylish and elegant fashion. Um, unlike Isabel Oakshot, who does nothing other than irritate people and shout down people and be rude. And Michael Hazeltine quite rightly shut her down recently again on talk TV when she decided well, along with her sidekick Tice to have a go at them. Um, you know, Tice has been involved with the Brexit movement for a long time with that idiot that's in that jungle program. And um, I haven't watched that jungle program. I'm sure many of you have, but I think it's best to boycott the jungle program and hit ITV where it hurts. Um, my petition against this morning is continuing to grow. And I urge you to please go on change.org and sign that and sign the other petitions I've started against Larissa Switlick and Merrilies Vandermeer to animal killers. I have had successes with my petitions in the past, and I had the Caprolius uh, shooting club, which goes around shooting goats in England. I had them removed from having events at Jason Atherton's restaurant and then Richard Caring's private members clubs. So petitions can work so please go sign those three petitions it would be very helpful change.org and just look me up and look up the names of those people and those things but we will come to the key topic of the evening now which i i was obviously unable to watch this um michael barrymore program um when it was live because i wasn't i wasn't aware of what time it was on on Saturday on Channel 5, but it is available to watch on the Channel 5 equivalent of the iPlayer catch up, whatever you want to call it. Um, it's called Michael Barrymore, Mr. Saturday Night. The rise and fall of Mr. Saturday Night is what it chronicles, and it references the whole bungled police investigation into the rape and murder at the home the bungalow owned at the time in Royden, Essex, by a man named Michael Barrymore, a disgrace to humanity who thinks he's now a TikTok star. He is utterly reprehensible, and as many of you know, I have been involved in campaigning for justice for the Lubbock family for a number of years now, and I have done interviews with um, Stuart Lubbock's ex-wife, who is a very wonderful lady who campaigns for justice. And his late father was also a very big campaigner. And this program is yet another investigation into a story of an incident where nine people went to a party in a house and only eight of them lived. And those eight people included two women who could not have committed the acts of gross and indecent assault upon this poor man before he died. And, and that leaves six others who could have committed this crime. And 
of those others. One of them, the owner of the property, fled the scene of the, of the incident before the police arrived. So that suggests something rather dubious about the whole matter. And I will come to what the police had to say about this. A former police officer, I don't know if he's still a police officer, but he was referred to as a, an, he was an Essex police officer at the time. His three scenarios for the situation. But this program, which is quite long, it's about an hour and 15 minutes or something, um, was quite interesting. It went over a lot of the old ground about who is Michael Barrymore and all the rest of it. It didn't cover very much about who else was at this party. It was somewhat lacking in that regard, and it did not feature um, the voices of, you know, other members of the family other than Kevin uh, Lubbock, the brother. Um, so the lady called Sue Homan did not feature in this program. Um, and but it did include the, the Lubbock family publicist, um, who I'd not come across before. Um, there were part, there was relevance to it. Um, it went through the bungled police investigation, which quite frankly is an utter shameful disgrace. This is a police force that basically didn't know what to do because Mr. Barrymore was quite so famous. Um, you know, they didn't want to have this situation, um, but vital evidence was lost. People were wandering around the swimming pool, blood sample failures, and two items disappeared. They were a door handle and a pool thermometer. And they did cover how that Michael Brown, Barrymore's agent, was allowed back into the house to collect items. What items did he take away? What items did Michael Barrymore himself run away with is the question that I would have added if I were the interviewer in this program. This program did not do enough to go into details, but most of you and most of the viewers would not know these details because I've read a lot more about it than most people. Um, you know, these. this was an evening where nine people went to a house after they'd been in a nightclub, and those nine people were called Michael Parker, aka Michael Barrymore, who said he need he needed an F star star K in a taxi as he left the Millennium Nightclub to return to his home, which was the scene of the death of poor Stuart Lubbock and the assault and brutal treatment of, of him. Um, you know, he lied to a coroner's court about facilitating drug taking at the house on the night in question. Also, he claims to have been the first to discover the body. But why did he go running away? He said, you know, other people know the are hiding secrets about what happened to Mr. Lubbock. I'm not going to say their names. I just hope they're brave enough to come forward one day, he previously said. Then, of course, there was a lady called Kelly Campbell. Um, she'd met him for the first time on the night of the incident, claimed not to be aware of what happened. Uh, a man called James Futters, or Footers, depending on how you spell his name. He has, he has multiple spellings of his name. He was the local paper boy turned chef. He was there, a local from the village, friend and neighbour of Barrymore. And um, yes, Barrymore, he later said, offered James a white powder on his finger saying, do you want to try this? And he told him that he leant forward and licked the powder. Claire Jones, who was then 17, she'd met Michael Barrymore for the first time on the night of the incident. She claimed not to be aware of what was happening, but she saw Barrymore rummaging through drawers and changing his clothes before police arrived. When he left the house, he had a bundle of material, whatever that is, material. Is that paperwork or is that something else under his arm? Um, Jonathan Kenny, who was then the lover of uh, Barrymore, he was an estate agent, drag queen. Um, he was 
later arrested on suspicion of murder. He's known for having a history of violence, was seen by um, Ms. Jones are running through the bink bungalow. I got the impression he was hiding something, she said. Justin Merritt, who was a bin man, he was the refuse collector, the janitor, whatever you want to call him. He got paid £30,000 by the News of the World for an interview in which he stated Barrymore had rubbed cocaine on Stuart Lubbock's lips shortly before he died. Then we have Kylie Merritt. She was also there, sister of Justin Merritt. She also alleged Barrymore rubbed cocaine on Stuart Lubbock's lips shortly before he died. Curiously, in the wake of her brother selling his account of the night. So we have to think of that. Simon Shaw, described as a local from the village. Michael Barrymore supposedly ran off to Mr Shaw's house to buy himself thinking time for two hours before he was questioned by the police at 7.49am. Well, why did Michael Barrymore not stay at the scene? That is an issue. So this programme, Channel 5, was an analysis of none of that, which I think is what matters in this story. It should be treated a bit like, you know, Cluedo, you know, the who done it, the elimination process. You know, you can eliminate the, the females present because they could not have performed the gruesome, ghastly things that were done to this poor man. And then he was thrown in a swimming pool because that helped destroy the DNA, of course. So that helped destroy evidence. He did not die of drowning. That is commonly acknowledged now. He died as a result of foul play at the home, the bungalow, which many people refer to as the mansion. It is not a mansion. It is a bungalow. It's a revolting, horrible house that should be raised to the ground because it's a scene of a horrific murder. Um, I don't see why these murder houses should be kept. Disgusting places like that, where things went on that were appalling. It's still got a swimming pool. I wouldn't think that that swimming pool was, should, you know, when it was sold last, I hardly think that was a selling point. Anyway, the program began by delving into the difficult childhood of Michael Barrymore and how he spent hours watching Norman Wisdom and mimicked him. It dealt with his time as a red coat at Butlins, which was his training ground as a comedian, allegedly. He was an entertainment manager who worked there, found him very dangerous. And there was an incident where he'd upset everybody, the other members of staff, and they threw him in a lake. I didn't know about that until now. But this was a man who was upsetting people even when he was very young. He was a bit of a weirdo, a bit of a freak, and a bit of an oddity. Um, that does not make him a criminal, and there is no evidence to prove that he actually perpetrated this crime. But the crime occurred on his property, on his watch, and he ran away. Now, if that isn't suspicious, tell me something that is. That is shameful, disgraceful, and it's illustration that the man has no moral compass. Shame on Michael Barrymore. Michael Barrymore should be thrown on the Bibby Stockholm. He should not be being celebrated on the TikTok channel, as is now occurring, but we'll come to that. So he was made his name in 1983 with the Royal Variety performance. He grabbed a member of the audience and dragged her onto the stage and started doing ridiculous things to her about nutcrackers with Swan Lake. He was seen to be off the wall, and it changed everything for him. By 1986, he had his own quiz show, Strike It Lucky. It peaked at 20 million viewers. Then in 1991, his own Michael Bar Barrymore show. No format, an hour of him doing whatever he wanted. This man started to become like a roller coaster of outrageousness. He just did whatever he chose to do. He was out of control, let's be honest here. He was universally adored by the public. He did a programme called My Kind of People where he went off into shopping malls. He got mobbed by the audience. God knows what these people saw in them. They're probably the very same people who would have mobbed Rolf Harris 
and Cliff Richard and Max Clifford and all of those others of that ilk, Scylla Black. Um, she, she's been proving rather unpopular today on Twitter for some reason also. Another strange woman, I must say. A strange woman from a strange era, just like this strange man. But, you know, he he descended into drunk and stupors and drugs because he couldn't cope with his situation, supposedly. His behaviour became more and more outrageous. There are pictures of him rolling around on the floor with a woman who I helped get a conviction for, Baroness Marie Claire, well, Marie Claire Baroness von Aldensleben is her name, a racist bigot who called a friend of mine a Jewish pig. She is a truly nasty piece of work, Baroness Marie Claire, Baroness von Aldensleben. She was received a suspended sentence for attacking um, Indian people in a hotel in Belgravia. I was present when some of this happened on that very evening. The, the woman is an utter disgrace, but she rolled around on the floor with him at a party at a, a Park Lane hotel. Absolutely dreadful people. Um, so I have to say, this man Barrymore was an utter disgrace. Um, you know, he always had a slight campness, but he was married to a lady called Cheryl. And Cheryl, from all accounts, was a very decent woman. I've not read her book. Sadly, she died of cancer. Probably she died of a broken heart. Um, you know, he claims he felt targeted and hounded. And he went one night to a place called the White Swan, he was drunk and he started singing New York, New York. Start spreading the news, I'm gay today. The Sun, he told them they turned up because other members of the gathering called The Sun. So they sent reporters. He said, I can't live a lie anymore. Nobody in the industry was surprised, the media industry and the entertainment industry. But he did not tell his wife, the poor woman, did not get a chance to even express an opinion. And Gemini says, poor Cheryl, I felt for her. Now, I agree with Cheryl, uh, with, with, sorry, with Gemini. This was a situation that should never have happened. You know, this was appalling. Um, Angela says, Barrymore and Schofield, two of a kind. Well, there are grave similarities between them, but um, Mr. Schofield hasn't had a death occur at his property, as far as I'm aware, to date. So that is something Mr. Schofield cannot be blamed for, but he can be blamed for piling misery on his family. At that stage, Barrymore did not have any children. Barrymore still doesn't have any children, though at one point he did express with a future mother that he wanted to have surrogate children, but that never actually happened. Thank goodness, because I don't think Mr. Barrymore would be a very good role model to anyone. Um, Max is in the room. Um, hello, Max. Lovely to hear from you. I'm just having a little bit of... I had a whiskey, but I'm now having a little bit of red wine that I have left over from my cooking from yesterday. So there we go. Yes, Joe McIntyre says Barrymore wanted to have kids with the boyfriend called Sean. Yes, Sean, um, I have his name somewhere. Um, anyway, Sean, whatever his name was, him and Sean went off to New Zealand. That didn't work out. I think Sean had a lucky escape. Cheers to Max and cheers to everybody else. Cheers to everybody listening. Barrymore was the first to defend Pip Schofield, says Paulie. Yes, well, birds of a feather, they flock together, as they say. So he had a breakdown at this point, and he felt targeted and hounded. He said, I hope you'll allow me to live my kind of life. Nobody does it like me. He did this as an award ceremony in front of Cheryl, his wife. The poor woman's face 
said it all. And of course, the camera's pointed at her. There we go. So I think that this was the beginning of the end of this ridiculous man. Admittedly, he is still going, but he will forevermore be tawdry because of what happened next. My kind of music, they brought him back. They tried to make him an all-round entertainer. You know, kids say the funniest things. Good with kids, they said of him. He has a childlike quality to himself. I wouldn't say he's childlike. I'd say he's very childish. He's ridiculous and he's an overindulged brat. He rather is like Violet Elizabeth Bott from the Just William novels. That is the character that I'd compare him to. He is not a child, a childlike. He is childish and he's a spoiled, overindulged pillock. And the fact that the likes of Martin Frizzell at ITV have been overindulging him by bringing him back and TikTok audiences who don't have a clue about him um, are celebrating him. Shame on them. So anyway, there we go. That is that. So he took up with this Sean. He wanted a surrogate child. Um, and then he split up with Sean on the 21st of March, 2001. The 21st of March 2001 is a very key date because one week later, the 31st of March, it all went downhill. He went to a nightclub called Millennium, which is where he met Stuart Lubbock. Um, and poor Stuart Lubbock was on a downer, according to his brother, because he was having problems getting access to his children. So... This poor man, destiny was not in the cards for him. And the brother said he'd played the cards, that the, he'd, uh, the tarot cards that very evening. And I'm not a believer in any of that myself, but he said there was a card of death. And unfortunately, that is what followed. But um, this man, Kevin, the brother of Stuart Lubbock, they went to the nightclub and they met Barrymore and they had the all right, you know, the usual nonsense of this person. And Kevin couldn't find Stuart, so he went home. And the next day he saw it on the news and he tried texting his brother. Um, and of course, the rest is a very, very tragic thing for the Lubbock family. The Lubbock family are very dignified people. And I respect them, and I think that they deserve all the support they can get in this wicked story involving a monstrous mess caused by a man who took no responsibility for the actions and the events that occurred when nine people went to his home, including himself, and only eight of them lived. Now, I do believe there could have been other people present, but um, when I interviewed Sue Homan with... Um, uh, another interviewer, I was told by her she didn't believe that. Now, she's closer to the story than I am, but that is very sad. Uh, Mary T asked, why didn't he have access to his children while well, they were going through a divorce? You know, it's all very complicated. This man was a perfectly wonderful gentleman, a good father, loved by many people, um, Everybody who talks about him has always told me what a delightful gentleman he was. There is no negativity about him. So, no, that is not a nice um, thing that was alleged about him because the papers were, of course, going down the route of this man, Barrymore, who had recently come out, as they say, and... Um, therefore associating the victim with being in that world also. But um, nothing wrong with being gay, nothing wrong with being straight, there's nothing wrong with being bisexual, there's nothing wrong with being anything. You, I don't buy into, as you all know, this LGBTQ plus XYZ, I'm a dragon. Um, but, you know, let anyone be whatever they want to be. But this man was a father of two children, and he was very much into women. 
ladies, according to every bit of evidence I've ever seen. So that was a very unfair thing by the media. Anyway, um, you know, now they brought in next on this program a police officer called Paul Mallory. And he spoke of the concern over Barrymore fleeing the scene. Mr. Saturday Night, you know, they've said, well, that might be a reason because he was so famous. Secondly, was he high on drugs? And third, was he involved? You know, a PR man called Mark Borokowski added, it was all running away. No crisis management. He should certainly have called a lawyer not his personal assistant. And the headlines were gay booze orgy, you know, around the death. His brother, Kevin, said he wasn't gay. They were saying the wrong thing. Subsequently, Barrymore was arrested and he was cautioned over cannabis at the property, but not Class A drugs. Clearly, cocaine had been involved. This man was treated differently to most people, because of the fact he was famous. Essex police were starstruck, in my opinion. I think that this is reprehensible and wrong. Subsequently, Mr Barrymore decided to do an interview with the since-disgraced Martin Bashir. It was referenced generally as a car crash interview. Uh, but Bashir, for once, did something decent, as opposed to what he did with Diana, Princess of Wales, and other people like Michael Jackson, who he targeted. It's almost tantamount to a crime, leaving the scene of an accident, he said. But by February 2002, you know, a year afterwards, Barrymore is back. He had a new series. ITV did not want to cancel The Biggest Moneymaker. But then they did cancel the show subsequently. They realised the rot had set in. The police officer, Paul Mallory, again. This was not a simple drowning. An assault had taken place. Barrymore claimed injuries were caused by the medical staff. Injuries were caused prior to death. An assault. This is horrific injuries. I will not detail them because they are too gruesome and grim to detail. Very, very sad. Terry Lubbock, the father of the victim, went after justice. Quite rightly so. Terry Lubbock, until the end of his days, when he died a very sad death, was a man who campaigned for justice for his dead son. To lose your child before you die is the most terrible thing. And this poor man, I raise a glass to the memory of Terry Lubbock, a decent gentleman and a wonderful campaigner for justice. At the time of the inquests, Kylie Merritt again claimed, you know, Barrymore had rubbed the cocaine on Stuart Lubbock's lips. Barrymore denied it. The inquest ended with an open verdict due to a lack of evidence. Shame on Essex police for not doing their job properly. You know, why didn't they stop people walking all over the crime scene? Why didn't they, they, they make sure that the agent didn't take things away from the property? Why did they not question Barrymore more about why he fled the scene of an accident? Why didn't they um, didn't they deal with the blood samples correctly? Why did they allow Barrymore to go around saying that this poor victim had been manhandled and abused in hospital when clearly the injuries upon him had occurred prior to his death? This is a shameful episode in the history of Essex Police. And Essex Police have a number of other problem cases one only has to look at the, the Jeremy Bamber case, the Rettenden Forest of Murders, lots of things that don't add up with Essex police. I don't like the Metropolitan Police, as you know, and I salute the, the 
British Transport Police who helped me recently. They were very, very helpful, the British Transport Police, but I, I've never had a good experience with the Metropolitan Police. I don't know Essex Police personally because I don't live in Essex, but um, all the people I know who've dealt with Essex Police tell me they are amongst the worst. Very bad. Very bad indeed. Um, and then we've got Lancashire Police with the Nicola bully case. Absolutely shocking, the conduct that has gone on there. So we don't need to justify criticism of these police officers because they did not do their jobs properly. Now, this police officer, Paul Mallory, said, I believe he was put in the pool. DNA goes away. The pool is just a means for a cover-up. That says it all. And at that point, Barrymore went off to New Zealand before he came back to do, in 2006, the programme called Big Brother. Why on earth would this man want to come back? If he had a brain, he would have stayed in New Zealand and kept under the radar for the rest of his rotten existence. He could have led a pleasant life there with Sean and, um, you know, maybe life would have been better, but he came back to England. Um, at one point, he even ended up working in a garden centre. I wrote about him selling weed killer. I said, you know, does he sell pool cleaner also? You know, this is a revolting, revolting little man who um, I did come across in a restaurant in Chelsea at the launch party, and he was there cackling like a hyena. He's a very loud, obnoxious, self-absorbed, attention-seeking piece of detritus. He is scum of the earth, and he's revolting because he had the responsibility of what occurred that night on his hands because those people went to a party at his home. He is responsible for what goes on in his home. If someone comes to my home, I would be responsible for their behavior. If they upset my neighbors, I would be blamed. And he should be blamed for what went on in his home when nine people attended that party in 2001 and, and, and eight of them lived. That is a shameful episode and he should be reminded of this till the day he dies. He should not be celebrated on TikTok. Anyway, I will finish this matter off with um, the next part, which is, you know, he, he decided to go in the Big Brother program. And when he arrived, the Davina McCall said he looks like he loved the fact people were cheering for him. But he told the producer he was nervous we'd put one of the Lubbock family in. And this man, who I thought was equally shameful, said we put Jimmy Savile in instead, jokingly. He said he didn't sleep there, thankfully. Now, we all know that um, Barrymore was dressed up as Hitler at one point in the programme. And he also got down on his knees and worshipped Jimmy Savile, a man who has been exposed as one of the worst criminals abusers in history. This is an utterly shameless, shocking, ridiculous situation created by greedy television presenters who have no moral compass, just like Mr. Barrymore. Birds of a feather, they flock together. So during this time, he was there with the likes of George Galloway, Preston, this um, musician whose brother I do know of, um, Chantelle Horton, who married the Preston character, and Jodie Marsh. And Jodie Marsh is um, a former friend of Omid Scooby. Scooby-Doo, there you go. Crime and grime. Anyway, Terry Lubbock served papers on him whilst he was in Elstree. And George Galloway turned to him and said, nobody needs an antidote. When about you, when you're turning it into an antidote about yourself, you're self-obsessed. And then a, a huge row followed between the two of them. But Mark Borokowski said he would have won it if it had not been for Chantel, who was a plant. The public wanted the plant to win because she wasn't famous. 
He was completely himself, said Preston. It was an incredibly powerful moment for him. Barrymore came out and he said it was the best. He didn't come out literally. He'd already come out before, but, you know, literally came out of the house. It was the best rehab for me. I've been to eight rehabs, he said. You should charge. He was subsequently arrested by two hard-nosed murder detectives. And one of them was Paul Mallory, this man I've mentioned before. They wanted somebody who wasn't going to be starstruck. He was fighting for his survival whilst being interviewed. We asked him questions about his sexual preferences. He was very offended. Of course, the vital evidence had been lost. The people wandering around the scene, around the pool, blood sample failures, the items disappearing. Essex police were condemned by the authorities for not properly preserving the scene. You know, Michael Brown should not have been allowed into the house to collect the items. He then appeared on this program, Piers Morgan, Life Stories. And of this, Paul Mallory said, Barrymore has cut corners with what happened that night. He did flee the scene. He knew what was coming. Still, he left. Kevin Lubbock said he should talk more about my brother, Stuart. And Harry Kishi, I don't know how you pronounce his name, publicist for the Lubbock family, says he is not the victim. Stuart Lubbock is the victim. Again, there were further arrests of a man aged 51, who obviously we know who he is, but I cannot name him. Um, process of elimination, you can work it out. Um, I have referenced the process of elimination in articles in the Steeple Times. Please go read them, because I think this case deserves to have a wider audience. Um, and... Um, on the 15th of September, 2021, Stuart Lubbock's father, Terry, a very courageous gentleman, sadly died without justice. Now, to die without justice for your dead child is utterly shocking and appalling. Um, Kevin Lubbock said, my father is now looking down on us, alongside my brother, basically. Um, Preston said, you know, Michael Barrymore was kind of like a ringleader. Others said he's now huge on TikTok. He'd be fantastic back on telly. No, he would not. We don't want him back until he tells the truth. We need to get the truth. The truth matters. And the police said there is insufficient evidence to bring any charges. Stuart's name will be forever be linked with Michael Barrymore, says the publicist. Quite right. At the end of the programme, they say, he declined Barrymore to appear in the programme. Essex police, then they issued a statement, they've admitted to the errors. This is a programme that didn't add a huge amount. Do watch it if you have time. I've given you the whole summary of it. I wouldn't normally go through an entire TV show, but there we are. That is what I have to say about that. But I, may I say... Rest in peace to both um, Stuart Lubbock and his father. Um, they are two people who have suffered quite enough. And the poor family, they deserve to have justice. And Michael Barrymore, you should man up, grow up, show up, and tell the bloody truth. It is about time you did something decent with your life instead of making videos of yourself throwing yourself into bins on tiktok where you think that little brats and of the all the rest think you're funny you're not a funny man michael barrymore you're funny in the head you are a disgrace to humanity you're revolting and you make me feel sick sick to my core because you had a party at your house and you are responsible for what went on there. And you know that nine people were there, a minimum of nine people. And only eight of them lived, including yourself. So do the right thing and tell the truth. Stop going on this morning and crying and turning up looking like the village idiot. And finally do something. 
to help the children of Stuart Lubbock who have grown up without a father. Shame on you, Michael Barrymore. You're a disgrace. Enough is enough. Anyway, I shall move on to my next topic. We are already at 45 minutes, so uh, I don't know um, how we're going to fit in this quiz. Um, a slightly more positive story next. The story of Monkey the Monkey, who's a children's toy. Um, a three-year-old boy, according to The Guardian, has been reunited with his lost toy monkey. It took a 600-mile railway journey. Um, Kanya Tay and her son misplaced the item, which he'd had since birth. The son is not named. Um, whilst changing trains on the first leg of a journey from Oakham in the East Midlands to Bristol Temple Meads. They realised what had happened as they arrived at Birmingham New Street to change trains and reported the loss. The item was located when the train terminated at Edinburgh Waverley. The monkey then travelled back down to Birmingham New Street the same day, and the station's reception staff adorned it with a hand-knitted jumper that they'd made themselves by the sound of it. And put the toy on a train to Bristol Temple Meads, from where the Tay collected it. So Network Rail said the monkey had clocked up an extra 619 miles on top of its planned journey. And um, Mrs. Tay said, my little boy was inconsolable when we realised we'd lost monkey on the train and we'd arrived at Birmingham New Street. But the treatment we received from the customer service team there who mounted a miracle mission to find the monkey again was above and beyond what I could have expected. I can't thank any everyone involved enough across all the train companies for not only making my little boy, sm boy smile again, but he loves monkey's new jumper and is full of questions, fascinated by the adventure he's been on. Um, there we go. So monkey was reunited. Now, it's a shame that Network Rail can't um, get their customers generally to locations without um, them having to sit on the floor because there aren't enough seats, but that's another matter. Um, you know, it's all very well having a little soft story like that to put out, which the PR department of Network Rail have obviously done. The cynical person in me says, you know, rather suits them at a time when they've had all this scandal of the fact that they're drivers and their staff have been on strike for so much of the year and all the rest of it you know we've had terrible disruption to travel in this country but you know monkey gets a free free ride of 619 miles as they say um i once found a little lego man in in the um victoria and albert museum and it came with a tag saying uh, this man is on its journey, and I wrote about this, and uh, I put it in a bar, and um, it carried on its journey. I don't know what happened to the Lego man, because the story ran dry, but there were little Lego men running all over the place, and they all had little tags, and it was all meant to be a story, but I don't know what became of that story in the end. But um, monkey, monkey did its monkey business, and monkey's gone home, so good for monkey, but... Um, I will say network rail, you know, perhaps you could actually make your trains run on time. Perhaps you could actually uh, look after your customers a bit better and, and stop putting out puff PR pieces. So that's my response to that. So show us the monkey, says Chris. Well, you can read about it in The Guardian. I will give you the link. Um there you are. Yes. Gemini says, our travel is rubbish. I quite agree. So we've dealt with Oak Shot. We've dealt with Monkey. We've dealt with Barrymore. And, and now I will come to another lighthearted issue, which is on the 7th of February, there will be an auction of um, items from the crown, 
special exhibits of the sets from series one to six, touring New York, Los Angeles, Paris, and London. There will be two auctions at Bonhams in February 2024, um, beginning on the 7th of February and running online from the 30th of January to the 8th of February. Now, amongst these items to be auctioned is the number 10 Downing Street facade. So it's the iconic black painted door of 10 Downing Street, which they estimate Bonhams at 20 to 30,000 um, pounds. It's the door and it's in a letterbox engraved first Lord of the Treasury at central octagonal door pool. The whole enclosed with a composite fiberglass painted architrave flanked by scrolled acanthus leaf corbels. Da 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 da. Black painted, painted iron railings. Da 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 da. It's a proper set that was used at the Elstree studio. The facades of numbers 10 and 11 Downing Street were recreated were recreated faithfully and to scale on the back lot at Elstree Studios from season one of The Crown. Interestingly, the door of number 10 had to be scaled up during the first two seasons when John Lithgow played Winston Churchill. The actor was considerably taller than Churchill, and so in order to ensure the realism of the scenes, the decision was made to scale up the door. So you can buy this door. You can also buy a more expensive lot, which is the Gold State Carriage, which is estimated at thirty to fifty thousand pounds. It's a reproduction of the Gold State Carriage of seventeen sixty. Um, it was one of the more challenging and expensive props constructed, and um, it's um, quite something. I don't know what you would do with these items if you bought them. Um, I imagine you could stick them in your hallway or something but um whatever you have to have a very big house so anyway um wise angel thought i was going to say wider than churchill so there we go anyway so that is that so um that is that story um anyway so look out for the auction coming up at bonhams there'll be Probably lots of publicity about it, but I haven't seen anything about it anywhere else, which is why I thought I would mention it. And meanwhile, the dreaded Ghislaine is surfacing again. She is now being sued yet again. The wicked, wicked woman, the mucky madam, the mendacious mucky madam, Ghislaine Maxwell, is being sued by a lady called Elizabeth Stein, who claims Jeffrey Epstein and Ghislaine Maxwell abused her over a three-year period. She was lured in as a college student, and um, she was forced to have sexual relations with them, and um, she was forced to have sexual relations with others, and this lady was raped, trafficked, and assaulted countless times in New York and Florida. Um, she is going after both Maxwell, who, frankly, I don't know why she bothers, because I don't think Maxwell has any money. She has money, but it's obviously hidden, um, typical Maxwell family behavior. This is Maxwell, who owes millions to lawyers. Um... And this lady, Mrs. Stein, has now got daughters and she feels the need to get justice for this. So um, it is an appalling story to read. Um, I can give you a link to an article about it and you can read it if you so wish. There is the link. I will say that this is yet another example of, you know, here is a story of a woman who has been convicted of sex trafficking people to someone, but the people who received it have never been convicted. 
this is quite something else, isn't it? This is quite an appalling story. Why do we not know the names of those that this poor lady, Mrs. Stein, was trafficked to? I think that is something that we need to know. I won't repeat the horrible story that is told by Mrs. Stein, but you can read it yourself there. Her name is Elizabeth Stein. I do think that it is time that we were told the names of those that Miss Maxwell, the mucky madam, the gruesome grabber, the boob barbarian, was sending these poor innocent victims to. This woman is a wicked, evil piece of toe rag, and she sits there in jail playing the Jewish card because that suits her so she doesn't have to do any work. She doesn't pay her lawyers, so she thinks she can get another one. If you're a lawyer, don't get involved with this woman. You might think she might make you famous. All she'll bring you is hell like she did to everybody else she's ever encountered. Ghislaine Maxwell is a wicked piece of junk. She should be thrown on the baby Stockholm. In fact, she should be made to walk the bloody plank. That's all I have to say on that topic for this evening. Anyway, as we have the lovely Harriet here, and if, she, if the lovely Harriet is willing, we could do a little quiz quickly, but we are at 56 minutes. This is quite a long one where well, I've been going. I normally don't go that far, but some. Right, well, Harriet would like to do a quiz, so we can do a quiz. Right. Question number one. I've been there on a number of occasions, and I once pulled out the plugs of Timmy Mallet when I was there, and I got shouted at by Timmy Mallet. Horrible, horrible man. I really don't like him. He was as creepy as Ghislaine and that awful Fred Talbot, who I also once encountered. A horrible weatherman. In which English county is the Jodrell Bank Observatory located? It is not the Lake District. It's not Essex. Simon Coates wins the point. Well done to Simon Coates with Cheshire. Cheshire. There we go. Question two. Charles Brown Fleet, pharmacist and inventor of the chapstick, also invented what other substance applied to or rather in the body? It was not Vaseline and it wasn't Botox. It wasn't Gavison. No. It wasn't lube or balm oil. It wasn't a heart valve or toothpaste or a Tampax or Tiger Balm. It wasn't shaving cream or blue tack or morphine. Some of you have very strange views of things that you would apply or put in the body. The winner is Anna Perkins with laxatives. Uh, Harriet, we will not be giving out the page on because somebody may have the book. I put a cross in the book now, so the page will not be repeated. But thank you very much, Harriet, for your idea. But we can't say that on air because there are cheats amongst us. I know most of you are very honest, but some of you are not. Shannon Airport, question number three, serves which European country? Well, that's an easy one. If you can't get that, Mary T gets it with Ireland. Mary T gets the point. Call is a Welsh type of, and often a synonym for what food? Call, C-A-W-L. It is not cheese. And it's not Hugh Edwards, and it's not lamb, it's not beer, it's, it is soup. 
So the winner is Harry Giles. Welcome to Harry Giles, who gets the point. Question number five. Would his 1911 work, Still Life with Harp and Violin, George Brack became the first artist to exhibit work in which art gallery during their lifetime? Tina asks, meanwhile, did I watch that film? Um, the film, um, sort of, uh, no, it's not been on yet here, yeah, so I will be watching it. It is not the Tate Modern, and um, Bobby gets the point. Bobby gets the point with the Louvre. Um, I didn't manage to go there during my time in Paris. I jolly well should have done. But unfortunately, I was dragged around the fashion retailers of hellhole, suburbs of Paris by a certain person, but that's a subject for another day. Question number six. Bridgeville, California was in 2003 the first town listed for sale on which online retailer? Bridgeville, California. The winner is Jason Warner with eBay. Jason Warner gets the point. Question seven for you um, Bond fans. Roger Moore first played the role of James Bond in which film? My drink is nearly finished, so we better hurry up. I don't know where Max is. Max, are you in the vicinity? Max Con uh, McConnell, where are you? Anyway. The answer to the question is Live and Let Die, and the winner is Leslie Wilson. Leslie Wilson got there first. Well done to Leslie Wilson, a new entrant. Thank you, Leslie. Question number eight. Natural hot water from geothermal activity is used to heat roughly 90% of all buildings in which country? Think earthquakes. The winner is Pipfield with Iceland. Hello, Pipfield. Iceland. Pipfield gets the point. Right. Question nine. Sloops, wherries, and dinghies are types of what mode of transport? Jason Warner gets yet another point. Well done to Jason with boats. Jason Warner. Halfway House in London, what are the Tate Modern and White Cube? Well, that's a very easy question. What are they? They're not museums. Um, Enoch Powell gets the correct answer with art galleries because the word gallery is too vague. Enoch Powell, but spelled very strangely. Um, you haven't got his name spelling correct, even though you call yourself that. But there we go. So we'll accept Enoch Powell on this occasion. What Question 11. What style of cloth was illegal in Scotland from 1746 to 1782? Mary T gets the point immediately with Tartan. She's very, very quick. There we go. Question 12. Dating back about 7,000 years... Which was the first bird to be domesticated by man? It was not the dodo. It wasn't the chicken and it wasn't the black. It wasn't the pyramid or the pigeon or the kite or... Oh. Um, Simon Coates gets the point again with goose. Well done to Simon Coates. Question 13. Under standards which standard conditions, sorry, which metal with the atomic number three is the lightest? Which is the lightest metal? Simon Coates wins yet again with lithium. Simon Coates seems to be very quick off the, with his fingers. Um, question 14. Dad's army was set during which war? You only have a couple of options here. 
Simon Coates again gets the point. World War II. Well done, Simon Coates. Very quick, aren't you, Simon Coates? Question 15. Iron horse is an archaic term, literary term for what mode of transport? It is not a tank. Paulie gets the point with train. It is a steam locomotive, though, so... But I will accept train on this occasion. That's fair enough. Train is fair enough. Caribou is a type of, and often a synonym for what animal? I think uh, Pipfield gets the point with reindeer. Reindeer is the answer. Question 17. In which country are fireworks said to have originated? Paulie gets the point with China. Paulie is the winner with China of that particular one. Question 18. The phrase three strikes and you're out is derived from which sport? The winner with baseball is Mary T. Well done to Mary T. Now, this question features someone I don't have much time for, a friend of the dreaded Cliff Richard and a friend of the late Cilla Black. Which Northern Irish TV presenter has credits to her name, including Rip Off Britain and Open House? It is not Savile, it's not Lulu. We need the full name, but Paulie gets the full name with Gloria Hunniford. Gloria Hunniford is the answer to your penultimate question. And the final question, as constructed by the Romans and found in abund abundance underneath Paris in particular, what sea is the subterranean cemetery of galleries with recesses for tombs? I've visited some of these in the Brompton Cemetery myself. And they collapsed because of all the lead and the bodily fluids did not mix. The winner with catacombs is um, is Pipfield, because even though you spelt it incorrectly, I will allow it. You were there first. You just had a minor slip of the Y and the T. So we have concluded our quiz and Simon Coates is the winner. So well done to Simon Coates. Congratulations to him. And thank you to all the rest of you for joining in. And what a wonderful thing. What do I think of Angela Rippon? Do you want her place on Strictly? I don't watch Strictly, no. Um, Chris says, I'm getting better. Well done. I hope you are getting better. I hope you are recovering from whatever you're recovering from. I wish you all the best. Um, Jason says he's not happy Anthea Turner was definitely the Irish presenter Well, not on this occasion, no um, Check the magnet over the weekend, says Tina Well, I will be visiting the magnet on an occasion, yes uh, Rue says his father's buried in the Brompton Cemetery Yes, I urge you all to visit the Brompton Cemetery if you have time But be very careful of the extracurricular activity of certain types of people that go there who are quite gross. Um, the Highgate Cemetery is also very interesting to visit as a cemetery goes. Um, you might see Jeremy Beadle's grave and graves of pianos and Beadle's about and all sorts of things and Karl Marx. Very fascinating place. Um, Angela would like to come into the Magnus and have a sing sing along a cliff no we don't need you singing cliff but um uh, graham burns the local piano playing genius may well choose to play some music for you so you could enjoy that but jeffrey says we don't talk anymore gemini asks where are my friends tonight um um i'm 
by myself up here doing this tonight, but there we go. Sing along, Max. Yes, well, Max could would, would likely be there. So anyway, thank you very much to you all for your lovely participation and joining in. I ho hope that it's, um, my analysis of that program was of use to you, and I thank you for your um, time and uh, participation. Harriet would like me to have a live from the magnet. Well, it might be a bit noisy, but we'll have to see if they approve. Um, there we go. So I shall wish you all a very happy evening and say good night to you all and good gardening. And as the late, great Childando once said, don't have nightmares. Take care and best wishes. I hope you all have a wonderful time. I don't know how to turn off this chat, but I press end and I believe it stops going on. Oh, um, Timmy Mallet says I'm to stop cheating. Well, whoever you are, um, I'm not cheating at anything because I'm not planning on doing anything. So whoever you are, uh, you're talking a load of old rot. Anyway, there we go. Good night to you all and good gardening. Take care. Pip, pip.